Okay, I think we can get started. It's a pleasure to, on behalf of Torah Motion to welcome Michelle Mar Margolis Chesner um, for first time to Torah Motion, so we can almost make a Shechiano. Uh, Michelle is the Norman E. Alexander Librarian for Jewish Studies at Columbia University and the uh, president elect of the Association for Jewish Libraries. She co directs Footprints Jewish Books Through Time and Place a digital project mapping the movement of Jews across time through their books and uh, her research focusing on the history of the book. I think it's a fascinating topic. Uh, books, you know, we're known as the people of the book, books tell the story, but it wasn't really until the 1400s that we had any printed books. So it's really, uh, it's a pleasure to welcome, to welcome Michelle and uh, for this beginning of a three-part series and Vakasha, it's all yours. Thank you so much. Um, so first, logistically, forgive me, I'm going to be back and forth between screens, so I may not see everything immediately in the chat. If you have an urgent sort of clarification question, I say something that nobody understands, please raise your hand because that I will see faster. Um, but otherwise, feel free to put uh, questions in the chat and I'll try to get to everything I can, uh, probably more toward the end, but if something comes up in the middle that seems that we should address it in, in, as we go, I'm happy to do that. Um, so as Rabbi Kelman said, I, I work on a project called Footprints. I'm a librarian. Um, I think about books all day. Um, I don't read books all day, a common misconception, although I wish I could. Um, so the goal of this course really is to introduce you all to everything you can learn about people by reading books, but without looking at the main text of the books. So here, what I'm going to talk about is everything except the text that's printed or written or produced in a book, um, because there is an incredible amount of history in everything else, in the bindings, in the, in the annotations, in the, in the actual writing, but not the words. We'll talk about a lot of different things. Um, <clears throat> so to start, I'll tell you sort of where I'm coming from. So I always uh, tell people that I like dirty books. So that's like a cute thing to say. Everybody sort of laughs and then looks at me a little bit strangely. Um, what does that mean? <laughs> so um, in here's an we have an example of a beautiful set here of the Talmud. Um, this is actually this was sold or put up for auction initially as part of the Val Madonna Trust collection in 2009. Um, this collection was up at Sotheby's. Lines went around the block, Second Avenue in the 70s. Um, to in Manhattan to look uh, to try and see this collection. It, it, it included representations of every single city that printed Hebrew um, throughout the early modern period. It was an amazing collection. And one of the crown jewels of this collection, it was actually part of a selection of 12 items that were sold quite a few years later in, in 2015, was the Bomberg Talmud. The Bomberg Talmud is the very first complete edition of the Talmud. There were there were additional, uh, sorry, individual tractates of the Talmud that were prints that were printed in the 1400s, but the full Talmud wasn't printed until uh, it began being printed in 1519. Um, and it's beautiful. It's it's a sort of collector's dream. It has wide margins, as you can see. Um, it's absolutely pristine and beautiful. It sold ultimately for $9.3 million, which is great. Hello? Um, but, we yeah. cannot see your screen. You, you, I didn't sell my, I didn't share my screen. I'm so right, sorry. Right. I, I was about to interrupt you, but thank, thank you. Okay, Ellen, for thank you for interrupting. It. There you go. That would defeat the whole purpose. Um, sorry about that. Thank you. Um, so, so this, this beautiful volume that you see here, um, sold for $9.3 million. And it's easy for me to say that I wouldn't want to buy something that's $10 million because I certainly don't have the $10 million to buy it. But something like this is something that's much more interesting to me. So I'm not sure how clearly you can see it. This is actually a manuscript. So it's handwritten. Um, it's, it was produced in the south of France in the 18th century um, in an area known as the Compton Venison. Um, and if you can see, if you read Hebrew, the words are the words from the Passover Haggadah. So the Rachza, the washing of the hands, Motzi and Matzah, eating of the Matzah, Maror, um, the Maror, and Korech, the Hillel sandwich, and then Shulchan Aruch, which is the Seder meal. Now, 
looking at this page from a Haggadah, um, it looks like, as I like to say, apparently they didn't have the custom that they did in my house, which is as soon as you start taking out the food, you take your Haggadahs off the table. And so they got this Haggadah quite good and dirty. And to me, this is exactly what I mean by dirty books. This is a book that tells a story. This is a book that was used and that we can learn something about. Um, if only by scraping some of the matter that's there and putting it under a microscope to see, you know, what kind of meat did they eat in the south of France in the 18th century, um, which we haven't done yet, but I have had a conversation with my conservator about it and I absolutely would love to do that. So what are we going to talk about in this class? Um, so a few different things. I'm going to try and start each course with an with an introduction to the historical topic, just talking about the context and, and what we're going to be discussing. Um, then ultimately, what we're looking for is the people, finding those people in the books. And then, after all, I'm a librarian, I'm going to um, share citations for further research and different ways that you can learn more because there's so much, each of these classes could be sort of a full semester long course. Um, but of course, we're not doing that. Um, so today we're going to talk about, uh, sorry, so these are the three, the three classes that we have. So, um, you know, I, I hope that we can be flexible if needed, if something comes up that seems like it's really interesting, um, we can, I, I'm pretty flexible about incorporating other things, but we'll see how it goes. Um, okay, so let's begin at the beginning, or at least at a beginning. Um, to talk about the Cairo and other Yeniso. Um, we're gonna go through a few different things. We're gonna sort of just start at the beginning again, to explaining what Geniza is, the legendary tale, um, which I'll discuss in a minute, why that's complicated. Um, and then of course, we're gonna try and find those people within the Geniza. Um, and, and to close, I'm going to discuss a little bit more in its sort of bibliography section. I'm going to discuss how we can, how we can engage with the Geniza today. There are a tremendous amount of resources, both online and in other uh, sources that you can use if you want to go ahead and learn more or engage with, really, and read documents from the Cairo Geniza. So what is Geniza? So Geniza comes from a Persian term, which means hidden. Uh, in the Persian context, that was usually used for treasure. In the Jewish context, it was used for sacred objects that were no longer usable, but because of the respect one has for sacred objects, were not just thrown away. Often they were buried. Sometimes they were put aside into a, a hidden space. And so this term Geniza, or in Yiddish, Shemes, is another term that's, that's used for it. Um, and uh, if I don't mention at the end something about these bl blue backgrounds, I hope that I will, but if I don't, please make sure that I do uh, for, the, for the images that you're seeing here uh, with the blue backgrounds of these manuscripts. So you can see this is all, it's, it's essentially trash. And in fact, there was a book written about the Geniza called Sacred Trash. These were things that were not meant to be used. They were done being used, and so they were put aside. What's the story of the Geniza? So if you ask Solomon Schechter, um, and if you look at most traditional histories of the Geniza until the last year, couple of years ago, you would have heard the following story. In 1896, Agnes Smith Lewis and Margaret Dunlop Gibson, who were twin sisters, uh, who were of uh, a significant means and would travel the world. They were also quite intelligent, actually. They knew a number of languages, and they did uh, quite a bit of scholarly research on their own, they ended up in Cairo. And while they were in Cairo, they, inter they met some antiquities dealers. They were looking for old manuscripts. They were looking for particular old manuscripts, but they came across some Hebrew manuscripts. They asked, where the, they asked the dealers where they got these manuscripts from, and they were shown to this synagogue in Cairo, in Fustat, actually, which is old Cairo. Uh, they were shown a crevice in the wall, and they took back a bunch of manuscripts to, to, to bring home. They called their friend Solomon Schechter. They said, come on over and see what we found. Uh, and Solomon Schechter saw the first document and he was amazed. 
um, he was amazed because the one of the first documents he looked at was a Hebrew version of Ben Sirah, also known as Ecclesiasticus, not Ecclesiastes. This is a different uh, set of proverbs. Um, Ecclesiast Ecclesiasticus had until that point only been known in its Greek versions. Um, and Christian scholars of the text had assumed that it was a Christian text. Solomon Schechter's thesis was that it was actually a Jewish text that had then been, that is that it was used in a Jewish context as well, but it had, because it was not known in Hebrew, it was only known from Greek, uh, he couldn't prove his argument. So when he saw a Hebrew version of Ecclesiasticus on these twin sisters table, he was thrilled because this showed that there was a medieval Jewish context in which Ecclesiasticus was used. And he said, this is a very important treasure trove. We have to go and find out more about uh, the manuscripts that are there. So Solomon Schechter went to Cairo in 1896. He collected, uh, he gathered bags and bags of manuscripts, almost 200,000 uh, fragments, some of which are very, very tiny. Um, and then he ultimately donated most of them to Cambridge. Some of them he brought with them with him to uh, the Jewish Theological Seminary when he became its president uh, in 1902. However, there's way more to the story. So my colleague uh, and a very excellent scholar, Rebecca Jefferson, published a book this past year called uh, The Cairo Geniza and the Age of Discovery in Egypt, The History and Provenance of a Jewish Archive. And Rebecca's book and her extensive research shows that there was, there are actually multiple Genizot. There were multiple spaces both within Cairo itself and also in other parts of the Near East um, where manuscripts were stored, were hidden, were buried. And throughout the 19th, even the 18th and 19th centuries and early into the early 20th centuries, uh, 20th century scholars, um, and, and adventurers would go to the Near East to try and find ancient manuscripts. And find them they did, and they brought them to the West and they were sort of deposited into uh, library collections. As the years went by, they were incorporated and the story of the Cairo Geniza became more famous. All of these collections were corporate incorporated into a single collection called the Geniza. And it was assumed that they all came from Cairo. They did not. Um, they were missing a lot of the information there. Um, and, and I'll talk more about that a bit later, but, the, but what I really wanna impress here is that just because something says Cairo Geniza doesn't mean that it actually came from Cairo or from the Ben Ezra synagogue in Fustat, which is the main center of the Cairo Geniza. And there were hundreds, there were I would say definitely tens of thousands of manuscripts that came from those locations, if not hundreds. Um, but it was a lot more, it was, it, there were many other places as well. So some statistics about what we now call Geniza. We know of about uh, 400,000 fragments. And again, this can be, you know, a one by one inch square to something that could be multiple leaves still somewhat bound together. Languages included um, it within just within Hebrew script are Hebrew, of course, Judeo Arabic, Aramaic, Ladino, uh, Yiddish, and then also Arabic, Coptic, Syriac, Greek, Latin, and Ladino. Um, Ladino is sometimes in Roman characters and sometimes in Greek, um, although here I think it's only in Hebrew characters. Dates of the Geniza uh, range from the sixth century of the Common Era to 1897. So we're covering a huge span of time. So what are we finding in the Geniza? Um, these fragments are, you know, and I titled this, this talk, the scraps, because scraps of history, actually scrap, these fragment scraps were, were pieces of paper or parchment or papyrus even that were meant to be used and then, and then be done with. Just like you write a note, you write a grocery list, and there are grocery lists that were found in the Geniza. These little scraps of paper that, that give us snippets of a person's life or people's lives. Um, we find uh, it, it's, it's sort of the history of what I call the Hamon Am, so the, the everyman. 
of, of the Jews, because all those things that are not preserved, not meant to be preserved, because they're not the writings of great rabbis, and they're not the writings of intellectual scholars or philosophers. It's a letter from a mother to a son saying, you never call, you never write. You know, those things are what end up being preserved in the Geniza. Uh, divorce documents. We have a huge amount of divorce documents um, in showing sometimes in in great detail what you know discussions of divorce, why and 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 quite uh, issues in marriage um, or discussions about marriage. Uh, disputes, many many disputes that people had. Um, okay, so here's an example, and I'm gonna again. It was just. Passover, so we, we're going to continue on that theme. Here you might notice it says Ha Lachma Anya. This is the beginning of the Magid portion of the of the Haggadah. This is actually a single long fragment, and this was uh, brought to my attention by a Guinea scholar named uh, Dr. Eve Krakowski, who's at Princeton University. Um, it's just a very long piece of paper on which somebody wrote the entire Haggadah because they needed to use it. The Haggadah is something that everybody needs to do to use for their Passover Seder. So they put it on a long piece of paper. The other side of the paper actually discusses riots in Alexandria during the 11th century. It was just, it was literally just a fragment, of a, a scrap of paper that needed, that somebody needed to write down the text of the Haggadah so they could use it for their Seder. And so they reused it. And that's something that this is a theme that we see really throughout the Guineas of, of, of use and reuse and what we can learn from all of these, from all of these documents, sort of both sides of the text, which often are very different. Uh, Dr. Sarah Pierce recently wrote a piece um, uh, that that chronicles the day of the life of one one individual in Cairo based on a uh, um, based on a letter in the Cairo Geniza. And I'll see maybe some of you, as I, I'm gonna read it, maybe some of you will guess who this individual is because he wrote in this letter. So uh, it has been a long day. So she writes it, Dr. Pierce wrote it as a sort of in, in second person, as if you're the person writing the letter. It has been a long day's work as a physician in the Sultan's palace in Cairo, attending to the medical needs of the chief vizier and other senior advisors. You mount your horse and ride nearly an hour home to the suburb of Fusta. You haven't eaten all day and you arrive hungry and dusty to find your front room full of people, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim, wealthy and poor, members of all guilds and professions who, like the palace retinue, require your med medical expertise. This is a regular afternoon occurrence. What do you do? Anybody, can anybody guess who it is so far? Rambo. Yeah. If you are Moses Maimonides, then you dismount your horse, wash your hands, quickly eat a small lunch, and then get right to work examining patients and prescribing treatments until you have been working in the dark by candlelight for several hours. You fall into bed exhausted without so much as a word to your family and repeat the same routine the next day, waiting for Shabbat so you can visit with friends and family and turn your attention to some of your other interests. So this information is all included in a letter that Maimonides, or the Rambam, Moshe ben Maimon, wrote to his translator, Yehud Ibn Tibon, who wanted to come and visit with Maimonides so that he could discuss issues relating to the translation of Moran Nebuchadnezzar, the Guide to the Perplex. Um, and, his, and Maimonides' response was like, I'm just too busy. There's so much going on. I'm not sure if I'll be able to meet you. So we have about 500 of Maimonides' uh, documents, of his own documents that have survived. Um, especially legal relating to, you know, practical halakha, practical law, religious um, matters, business matters, uh, family questions. So here we have on the right uh, is, an, is a question regarding an oath. A teacher apparently had an oath um, with a particular family. He swore an oath not to teach the daughters of a particular person. Uh, but then he regretted the oath. He had lost wages and the girl's education was stalled. And so he asked Maimonides, am I allowed to rescind this oath and go back and teach those girls that I swore I would never teach again? Uh, sure enough, Maimonides said, yes, it's fine. You have to nullify it in front of three Jews, which is generally uh, what one does for, um, 
for to nullify an oath. Um, on the left, we have here a, a document, a charity document, and if you can read it, it's a little bit faded. This word is Moshe Ben Rabbi Mamon. So this is actually his own signature, signing a letter for a charity collector, saying this guy is legitimate. You can give money. His his um, his charity, uh, his his what the thing he wants to collect for is legitimate, and you should and you should um, support him. One of the most famous examples of Maimonides documents that we have in the Geniza, from the Geniza is actually his draft of the Mishneh Torah, of his major um, magnum opus on Jewish law. Um, and there we have, there are copies today at the Jewish Theological Seminary and Cambridge of parts of this work um, in Maimonides' own hand, and they include crossouts and emendations as he was writing this work. So we see actually the work of this of this brilliant scholar in process through the through what has survived from the Geniza. Maimonides, of course, was not the only fam famous rabbi that we hear about from the Geniza. Uh, we, there are letters that are preserved from rabbis uh, Sharira and Rabbi Hai Gaon. Uh, they were Geonim, they were the leaders of the two major academies. Uh, Geonim was a term used for leaders of the two major academies in Sura and Pampadita from the 6th to the 11th century. Uh, Shrira and Haigaon were of the last of the Geonim. And the letters that we have are letters that were sent from their students uh, who were brothers, Avraham and Tanhum, who lived in Fez. Uh, it appears that Avraham and Tanhum would gather questions that needed to be asked to sort of the sages of the generation from their community in Fez. They would send them to the academy at Pimpadita. Um, in this case, it was in Baghdad. The academy had since moved to Baghdad. And in return, the leaders of the academy would respond to the brothers with these questions. Uh, <clears throat> okay. What else do we have? We have the earliest examples of, uh, of musical notation. Uh, they are preserved in the Geniza. This is a, a remarkable story. So Ovadia Hager, Ovadia the the convert, uh, was formerly known as Johannes of Opido. He was a Norman Italian monk who converted to Judaism in 1102 after he was inspired by the 11th century Archbishop Andreas of Bari, who also converted to Judaism. As one might imagine, if a member of the church in the, 11th, in the, 12th, the early 12th century converted to Judaism, Western Europe may not be a safe space for him. He went to Constantinople, to Iraq, to Baghdad, to Aleppo, Damascus, Banyas, and, and Tyre, and eventually he ended up in Egypt. What we have from his work, uh, we have 19 leaves of, of uh, documents related to him, including his memoir, 14 pages of a memoir, three musical leaves like you see here, a prayer that he wrote, and then a letter from Rabbi Baruch of Aleppo that testifies to Ovadia's sincerity as a Jew. So as a convert that had come from Christianity, he, he needed to have this letter saying, this is a legitimate conversion. This person is, is a true a Jew. Um, also, also from Ovadia, we have the earliest, so this is the earliest example of Judaic texts set to musical notation. Um, and after Ovadia, after the 12th century, the next example that we have of musical notation for Jewish texts are actually, again, produced, by, uh, not again, because Ovadia was Jewish, but produced by Christians in the 16th century. These were Christians who were studying uh, cantillation, the, the Torah reading, the, the, the music, as it were, of Torah reading. And they wrote, uh, Johannes Reichland, for instance, in the 16, in 1518, I believe, wrote, published a, a book that included a section where the the trump, the cantillation, tar cantillation was sent to set to musical notation. But during that, otherwise, there's there's nothing other than Ovadia's chants. And what I'm going to do, I wasn't able to play it, so I will. I'll put a um, at the end. I'll put all the links in the chat, including um, a, a rev, somebody actually recorded the music of how it would have sounded, um, of how these, these music, how this music would have sounded. A couple more things. Um, 
three more things actually uh, before we move on, uh, before, we, before we talk about engaging with the Geniza. Um, one, we have an amazing uh, report from the early 12th century, which narrates how in 1120 and, in 1120 and 1121, an unnamed woman, we only know her as the daughter of jo Joseph, the son of the physician, uh, announced that Elijah the prophet had appeared to her in a dream, indicating that the coming of the Messiah was imminent. This apparently caused great excitement among the Jews of Baghdad, where she lived, which concerned the leaders of the government and imprisoned the Jews in the imperial mint. As the story goes, additional appearances by Elijah to other Jews and to the Caliph himself ultimately led to their salvation. All we have about this information is a document from the Cairo Veniza, which tells this story. We don't know what else happened. We just have this little snippet of what must have been a, an amazing story. Um, as I mentioned, uh, there was a lot of reusing of paper. So as you can see here, this was a pen trial. The, the owner, the writer of this paper was writing practicing really with their with their quill to write different words and there's names and like bereshit so these are standard words that somebody would use if they're just trying to get their quill to work or, or testing out how they write the letters but I zoomed in because I want you to see these little scratches here which is actually Greek um, and this is something this is called a palimpsest a palimpsest is a document that was used for one uh, for writing one piece, and then that material either faded or was scraped off, and then it was used for writing something else. And that's what we see here. And Professor Marina Rostow uh, wrote a book called The Lost Archive, which documents how the Cairo Geniza actually is an, a critical source for medieval uh, Arabic cultures in in that area in the in the Egypt in the area of, of Egypt and and its surroundings, because uh, because proclamations that were made by the government were written in Arabic, disseminated to the people, and then were meant to be thrown away. But people then wanted to use them for letters, and so we have those proclamations or those announcements of various activities in Arabic of what was going on in the general society around the Jews because they then reused these documents in order to write letters or write a shopping list or take down a, a medicinal remedy or something. So we have all of that. Another um, another piece that we see very much from the Cairo Geniza, um, one of them was made famous by uh, Amitav Ghosh in, in an antique land uh, where we see travel and business and trade across uh, vast amounts of land. So uh, we have an example of the mid 12th century Tunisian trader, a Abraham Ibn Yiju, uh, who started off, he was Tunisian. He then traveled to Mangalore in India. He ended up in Aden. Uh, he was in India for about 17 years before going to Aden. And then he, he landed finally in Fustat. While he was in India, he bought a slave uh, he bought more than one slave, but this particular slave's name was Ashu until she converted to Judaism and her name was then changed to Bracha. Um, and Abraham freed her and then married her. Uh, and there is some discussion in the letters. We have about 70 letters with Abraham Ibn, Ibn Yishu from the, in various collections of the Cairo Geniza. So we know a lot about him. Um, and there's a whole bunch of questions about his wife. And there's a discussion of what happens if you have a slave and then they convert, are you allowed to marry them? They, they actually go into these discussions. Um, Abraham was involved in import export, as you might expect, he was going all over the known world. He had a bronze foundry. He was quite a busy man. Um, he just, so his letters discuss things like shipwrecks. Um, and 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 um, property that was lost, but also he was a practicing Jew, and so some of the letters discuss respons responsa, so religious questions that were asked, and then the answers that were given regarding religious practice. Some of his uh, letters include prayers or poetry. We find a poem by Judah Halevi, who was his contemporary, which means that he that. He knew Judah Levy's poems during the time that Judah Levy was writing them, 
And he, his poetry apparently got as far as India, which was where Avram was at the time. We see letters on cloth because paper wasn't always easy to get. So they would write letters on various uh, media. And then of course, as we see again, throughout the Geniza, just gossipy letters. Like I heard that your brother Mivasser is a good for nothing was a quote written in one of these letters. So people were just discussing, you know, your average daily conversation is all documented in what we have. Um, okay, I'm gonna end this section by just giving you, showing you this text, which I love to show people. Um, I, this is a Columbia manuscript and I show this to my students, especially those who have some kind of Jewish education and walk into the library and say, oh, I know all this stuff. And I say, what is this? Um, and if somebody wants to unmute and, and give a guess, you're welcome to. Um, if you've heard me talk about anything before, then you, you know, so then you can say it. But... I could do 30 seconds before I give it away. So it's actually a portion of Tractate Menachot from the Talmud. Um, I, I recently had a class that came in and somebody looked at it and said, oh, this looks like it's Talmud. And then somebody else was like, no, no, it's not. It can't be. Because Rashi and Tosafot, your standard commentaries that in printed Talmuds are written on either side of the text are not there. Well, the reason that Rashi and Tosafot are not included on these manuscripts is because it's from the 10th century, which was before either Rashi or the Tosafists were born. And so this is just the Talmud text. And so we have all sorts of different kinds of um, materials in the Geniza that, that show us many, many different things. And we can learn you know, from the, from the most mundane to the most sacred, and sort of across the board about Jewish life and living during that period. I'm going to stop a moment and just take a look at the chat um, to see if there's anything that I want to mention. Thanks for the link to Rebecca's book. Um, I, I appreciate that point. Uh, many of the documents in the Geniza are not sacred and potentially could have been put in the trash. A lot of letters, especially, were written with uh, used uh, standard sort of verses. They would quote verses from the Bible in, in their writing that was part of their conversation. And so often just because something was written in Hebrew, it, it was then put in the Geniza. Um, it's some of the things that are in the Geniza, it's sort of like, it's, it's, it's clear that it wasn't sacred by any means and wouldn't have been considered sacred, but, and yet. Um, meant so much of this material did end up there. So yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Um, Geniza's besides in Ben Ezra and Cairo. So there was another synagogue in Cairo. I don't remember the name of the synagogue right now, um, but I they, the scholars also talked about going and burying and digging up uh, Geniza from this, uh, not Geniza, of fragments in the cemetery because it, Geniza is often buried um, in the cemetery. So they would go to cemeteries, um, but in Professor Jefferson, Jefferson's book, she also talks at length about Genizot in other cities. So in Jerusalem, in Tehran, in, um, in various places, really around, um, around Eastern, Eastern Europe and, and the, near, the Near East, different places where Jews lived and they had Genizot in India. She talks about a uh, trunk that was filled with fragments that one of the one of these uh, explorers talks about finding. Um, okay. Yeah, Solomon Schechter knew, knew quite a few languages. He was quite the scholar. So I want to talk just a little bit about engaging with the Geniza today. There are a no, there are a few different ways. Um, that one can engage with the Geniza. So the, mo the most recent innovation has been the scribes of the Cairo Geniza project. Um, this is a partnership with the Geniza lab out of Princeton and the University of Pennsylvania and some other partners. Uh, they went to, they partnered with Zooniverse, um, which is this major crowdsourcing platform. And I'm gonna put this right in the chat so you can see it. Um, 
to actually allow people to identify and transcribe the um, manuscripts from the Cairo Geniza. So I will actually, maybe I'll just end my share for a minute um, and show you the kinds of things you can do um, with the, with the Geniza lab, if I can find the right. It's not it. So, my books. Ah, okay. This is, this is this is actually. I'm gonna just drop some some um, links in the chat as I'm as I'm sharing this particular screen. Um, this is where you can hear examples of. Uh, Ovadia Hager's music. This is at the Jewish Music, music Center at a uh, Hebrew University, and I don't want to I don't want to spend the time playing it because it doesn't always work on Zoom. But you can actually listen to to the chanting from from that um, from that music. There's a website dedicated to Ovadia Hager that I'm gonna also just drop in the chat there, um, and that includes all of the manuscripts from uh from his collect that that deal with his story which is it's just amazing um so the oldest I'll, i'm going backwards i'll end with the scribes of Cairo Geniza in this case um the oldest site working with Geniza material is the Friedberg Geniza project the Friedberg Geniza project started in the 90s um and they worked to uh just digitize and put online as much as they possibly could one of the things that they did, and this is part of the blue, I'm getting back to the blue here, um, the blue backgrounds is they, they wrote computer technology that would allow uh, users to, you, to, to, as if with puzzle pieces, to put fragments together so that you can see, this is a great example, but these two uh, were once together, as you can see from the holes here to put fragments together so you can create what's called joins. So if a manuscript is in Cambridge and a manuscript is at JTS, you can, you can connect the top and the bottom through digital means. And it was incredibly innovative when it started. It's still a great place to look for specific guineas of fragments. They have a tremendous amount of material. Um, nearly everything actually in existence is digitized and available on this website. Um, <clears throat> The, so then the, the scribes of the Cairo Geniza project, uh, as I mentioned earlier, allows you to actually transcribe. If you have a few minutes and you want to just spend some time with a manuscript, you can look at a line and literally transcribe every word on or as much as you can on that line. And it will be incorporated into a larger corpus so that other scholars, so that scholars can, can use the work that you've done. I'm not going to do that right now because I don't want to um, mess it up. But it's a wonderful site, and I encourage you to take a look and spend some time there if you're if you're interested. Uh, okay, let me stop that share, and we'll go back to the other share. So this actually this this image that you see here is one of the things that was found through this work on the through this work on the Cairo Geniza. People around the world who were working on transcribing manuscripts from the Cairo Geniza came across this image and they realized that it was a Haggadah uh, with Judeo-Arabic instructions from the somewhere in the 10th to 11th centuries that they were able to identify because they were actually looking at these texts. One of the things that the folks from the uh, Geniza Scribes Project did was they created a Haggadah based only on Cairo Geniza materials. So I, I'll post the link shortly. I have to pull it back up, but uh, they, but it's it's a wonderful resource. If you want to use manuscripts for your Haggadah, there are many manuscripts you can buy that are bound, um, some more expensive than others, but you could also use just Geniza fragments for at your Seder if you want to. Um, what else? I'm also going to include, so there's a, there's actually a Twitter account uh, for the Geniza Lab, and I, I recommend just taking a look at, if you're, if you're a Twitter user, um, it's a wonderful thread that goes into all the ways 
uh, you can get into the Geniza, all the, all the resources for learning more about the Geniza. So I just wanna mention, I talked a little bit about other Geniza just in Cairo. These manuscripts are from something that's generally called now, has, has come to be called the European Geniza. So as you can see, these are actually bindings. These are volumes of uh, notarial records in Italy that are bound with Hebrew manuscripts. In some cases here you see it, it looks like it's actually two leaves that are bound together. Um, at the collection that I curate, you can see this is, a, this is actually a printed volume from the 15th century of Terence's plays bound in a text uh, from the Bible. This is actually Exodus, um, just turned sideways and, and binding the, the book. So this is something that uh, another project called Books Within Books has, has taken on and they have discovered many um, early, early manuscripts that are now used in bindings. In, in one case, a lampshade because it was reused in the modern era. Um, Mauro Perani is a scholar uh, in Italy found a viola, so a, a, the, like a violin, uh, using parchment, using Hebrew parchment as part of its backing and many, many other examples. Here's another one where the closure of the manuscript is actually taken from a piece of Hebrew parchment. So there are a lot of different, different kinds of ways that you see, um, that you can see the reuse of Hebrew materials and sort of where we're discovering all of these Hebrew materials that, were, that seem to have been lost because they were, they were probably discarded, possibly in some cases confiscated and then reused in other contexts. And then I think my final uh, slide is the, before we get to questions, is, um, is a printed piece that is found in the Geniza because next week we'll talk about both manuscript and print, but not fragments, um, actual codices. And this is a really interesting example because it's print before print. This is this was probably created with a wood block. It wasn't created with movable type, which is what uh, Johannes Gutenberg was so famous for. It was a single carved object that then had ink added on. Actually, in this case, it would have been the ink would have been put on in two phases so that the red could go on as well. And is dated to the early 15th century because print existed in the Far East as early as the 13th century, if I'm recalling correctly. Um, but it and the but uh, Gutenberg's innovation was movable type, so we see an example of Hebrew print prior to Gutenberg, um, also from the Cairo Geniza. So there's a tremendous amount that that's there that we don't necessarily know about, um, and we're still learning. We're still learning. There's so much there. Um, okay, so I'm going to stop my share, and I'm going to do a lot of dropping of some things that I said into the chat. Um, and then I wanna give everybody a chance for some questions. Um, so uh, one, one book I didn't mention, um, which I absolutely should is um, S.D. Goitain was a tremendous scholar of the Cairo Geniza. He went through thousands and thousands of documents and he wrote a five volume work called A Mediterranean Society. <clears throat> based on his study of the Geniza. Um, his work was, per was only on the social aspects of the Geniza. He didn't touch, for instance, rabbinic manuscripts or legalistic texts, except for the social aspect of them. So there's other work that's being done on, um, on, on the rabbinic piece, on, on the religious piece. He was really interested in families and in society and how the community operated as we learned from the Geniza. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, Goitain also wrote a book on uh, Mediterranean traders, which discusses a lot of that trade across uh, the Mediterranean based on documents in the Geniza. Um, I mentioned Rebecca Jefferson's book, Sacred Trash, is a more popular work about the Geniza more broadly. Um, then I have the link to Dr. Pierce's article on Maimonides and sort of a day in the life of Maimonides. Um, Marina Rostow's book, The Lost Archive, on how the Geniza um, tells us so much more about the our larger society around the Jews, the Jewish community. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then Books Within Books, which I mentioned, which is this 
new project based on books in Europe that are often used in bindings or in other reused, not buried as Geniza, but they're, that are found in different contexts. Um, and in an antique land by Amitav Gash, uh, which discusses this, this trader uh, from Tunisia to India. So I'm going to pause for a minute and see if there are any questions before. Uh, that was an actual slide. It, it's, it's, sorry, the question was uh, the Bomberg Talmud in the first slide. Um, and I'll discuss this more uh, next week. But the, um, that Talmud that was sold at the Val Madonna uh, collection was one of, I believe, 12 complete sets in existence that have been complete from the time they were sold until the present day. So it was sold together and it remained together, which is very unusual uh, for a Talmud, for an early Talmud, for reasons I'll discuss next week. Thanks. Right. Any any other questions? Who who bought the um, the Talmud? May I ask? The nine point eight. There million. was not an official. Um, there's rumors over who bought it, but I don't want to say because I don't know for certain um, it was of, of the person who bought it. An investor, actually, they supposedly. If it is who I think it was, then it was an investor who bought it as an investment. Not not like, a, you know, not a, a guy learning in, in, in Kolo who wanted to, you know, get the original. No, I'll do, though I do know collectors um, who... <laughs> There's a famous collector in Jerusalem who famously, you know, brings his 16th century imprints on the bus with him because he's learning from them. Um, but uh, I know somebody else who who uh, who bought a early medieval Bible that he takes out every week to study um, to study the Parsha, you know, from a thousand years ago because it's the same text. Um, but my understanding is that that was seen as an investment. I guess on that, we know like in that Sea Scrolls, the texts are not exactly the same. Are the, do we have any differences sort of in the biblical text from the Cairo Geniza to what our present day, you know, Taurus have? I Not I, as far as I know in the biblical text. That's part of what's unique about the Dead Sea Scrolls is, is there differences? Um, but as far as I know, and I certainly could be wrong, but as far as I know, there haven't been. Um, what you do find actually is differences in Talmud. Talmudic texts all over the place are, and there's a whole database dedicated to find, to showing differences in Talmudic texts. Uh, that's the Lieberman Institute database. I don't know um, so there's a question about the processing aspects of Geniza collections. Um, that's, uh, I, I'm not sure what you mean. Um, Geniza collections were processed across, you know, 150 years. So they were processed differently at different times. Um, I can talk about the collection I deal with because that's what I know best, um, but really everybody processes them differently. Some collections have them um, have them as a distinct unit. Sometimes they're cataloged as manuscripts along with all the other manuscripts in a particular collection. Um, it really depends. And what, what we found when we, when, when we started looking deeper into our uh, alleged Guinea's and manuscripts was that most of them actually came out of bindings. Most of them were Western European binding fragments. So they weren't actually um, from this corpus of the Cairo Guinea's. And that's exactly what I was saying before is that just because something is a fragment, just because something is a single leaf of paper doesn't mean that it came out of that archive in Cairo. Okay. All right. If that's it, uh, we'll uh, thank you very much. And please, God, we will okay. see you next next week. Uh, okay. Well, um, I, I mean, I just one last thing, if I may, just I'm thinking about it. Yeah, I, I know this is, um, you know, hal halakhically, there's a whole whole debate about how manuscripts should affect halakha. And the Chazanish famously said it should not. Rabbi Vadi Yosef said it, 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 it should and could and you know, and must, and uh, I just, if you want to comment on that, or, or you know of like major things that we found in the Gnisa that that would change our understanding from a halachic rabbinic, you know, point of view. I assume at Columbia, that's less of an issue, but you know, sort of here, I'm, I'm kind of interested in that idea. It's funny you should ask because Columbia has something that's known 
among Talmud scholars as the Columbia Talmud, uh, which is a Yemenite Talmud. It's not from the Geniza at all, but it's, uh, it's Yemenite from 1546. Um, and we have about five Masechtot, so five tractates from this volume, including Megillah and Psachim, um, that do have some differences in, in how, you know, it's like where a no is a yes or a yes is a no. Um, and that completely changes the halakha. Um, but my understanding is, is like you say, that in general, that doesn't impact the actual legal decisions for, for Jewish practice today. Um, I, I'm going to spoil one of the things I'm going to talk about next week, which is that um, when print began, um, and I'll discuss this more in depth, there were some rabbis that were very, very concerned about the errors that printers would make um, in the Talmud and that you shouldn't use printed volumes because uh, printers make mistakes and they make things up and they don't know what they're talking about and all of that. So this, this concern about new technology and how people are gonna use them where you should use manuscripts because they're the original texts and those are the better texts. Um, sort of on a related topic, um, Maimonides, so Rambam writes in, I can't remember what the topic is, and this is from a printed version of the Rambam, a Mishnah Torah, um, where he says, Re'iti b'ktaviyad yashan, so I saw in an old manuscript. So when you're talking about Maimonides, who lived, you know, just after the new millennium, the new common era millennium began, um, talking about an old manuscript from what he writes is 500 years ago. Those are manuscripts that we don't, what does that even mean? We don't have manuscripts, Hebrew manuscripts, Jewish manuscripts from later than, from earlier than the, the seventh, eighth century or so, other than the, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are sort of in its own, in their own category. So what was Rambam looking at that he would say, this is what I saw in an old manuscript. So it's, it's this sort of hearkening back, you know, even when, when um, people of ancient times looked back on people of ancient times to them, to sort of say, I, I can state with this with, an, with authority because it's from a really long time ago. Um, and that's something that you find that people use even a thousand years ago, they were saying that, that this is from so many more years ago than, than me. Um, somebody asked about the printers being Jewish. It's a great question. Many of them were not. Um, and we'll talk about that more next week. Um, the Val Madonna collection, <laughs> the Val Madonna collection was sold. So in it, the initial, the initial, um, offering of the Val Madonna collection was for the entire collection to be sold as a block um, for anywhere between 25 and $50 million, depending on the moment and the year and when, when it was being offered. Um, ultimately, it didn't sell in 2009. And in 2015, Celebes made the decision to take the 12 top items. So the cheapest item, as it were, sold for something like $87,000. So we're talking about significant materials. Most of them were in the six figures, some in the seven figures. Uh, so those sold individually as, um, as uh, like, like the, this Bomberg Talmud. Um, and then the remainder of the collection, most of it went to the National Library of Israel, um, but portions of the collection that already were at the NLI ended up in other, uh, with other, booksellers and they ended up in other collections as well. So it wasn't completely scattered. The, the vast majority of it ended up at the National Library of Israel. Um, Chaim Gachak pointed out that some of the collection is at the Library of Congress, um, some is at the, the National Library of Canada, some of it is at Columbia, I can say. Um, there, it's all over the place because lots of dealers got it and it was sold um, in many different, to many different places. Um, but the vast majority of the collection ended up at the, at the National Library. Okay, thank you. Okay, just uh, before I leave, I, I see somebody point out to Count Yoma, reminder, of course. And uh, I you. guess, you know, I, I forgot to mention the beginning. I guess I think it's important to mention today, of course, is Yoma Zikaron uh, in Israel, uh, the over 25,000 people who, who've given their life so we can enjoy the state of Israel. There can be a state of Israel. So I just want to make mention of that. And of course, the uh, 
guess it's a, a tragic but beautiful idea the way we combine Yom HaZikron and Yom HaTzma'ut. Uh, you know, that we go together and Rav Salavesh, of course, developed that theme. It's a copy of Tiny Esther and Purim and the ninth of uh, Tishrei and Yom Kippur. That's the Jewish way. The uh, double moods go together. We can't have two moods on one day, so we divide these holidays into, into two days. So uh, we should hear good news from Israel. We should hear uh, wonderful things and uh, Thank you, Michelle. We'll see you next week. We do have a triple header of learning tomorrow at 11 a.m. Marty Luxon will give part two on um, the covenant after the code or the um, right, Parshat Mishpatim after Mamad Harsinai at 1 p.m. Rabbi Moshe Shulman will be talking on Midrash, um, part two and unlocking Midrash. And at 8 p.m., Dr. Sokolo is back, of course, but with a new series, The Philosophy of Mitzvot. On Thursday, uh, Alan Schwartz will give a share on the dry bones of Yecheskel in honor of Yom Atzmut. That will be at 1.15 on Thursday, a regular partial share at 8.30 in the evening. Uh, and then my share on the sitter at 9.30 a.m. Friday morning, when I can leave back Sunday, uh, Ruth with Simi Peters on Monday, and uh, Mark Shapiro, of course, on Monday night. I think that gets most of the classes of the week. And uh, okay, everybody be well. And uh, Lila Tov, and uh, please God, we'll see you next week. And uh, hopefully, we'll see many of you before next week. And uh, Lila Tov, everybody, bye bye. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.